Young Vincent, uh, once again, we start off. We're starting off on a new, a new Beatles album phase. What is it? Yes, and I had a, I had a coin toss on this, but it just occurred to me a minute ago which one I was going to do. We're moving into the two last, the two officially last records of the Beatles constellation of albums, and uh, uh, the actual historical um, chronological releases were Abbey Road and then Let It Be. Okay. All right. Even though Let It Be was actually made before Abbey Road, Abbey Road is officially their last creation. You know? Okay. So I decided that, in light of everything, I really think, like, see, what happened was I, I just did a little search on why Let It Be was released after Abbey Road, and the thing was they had finished it, and it was uh, it was produced. Let me see if I could find this here real quick. It was produced, uh, yeah, it was mixed and compiled by Glenn Johns, and, and it was temporarily shelved. Uh, a new version was created by Phil, Phil Spector in 1970. So, wait a minute, let me get the chronology right. They, they had Let It Be in the can. It was in the can. And why didn't they release that? They didn't release it because it didn't, they were artistically unsatisfied with the final result. Oh, okay. That was when Lennon, I think, called in Phil Spector. Okay. Um, and Lennon had like, Lennon really dug Phil Spector. I think it's because, you know, the rock and roll roots that he, Lennon was starting to lean toward, you know, at that point. Okay. And, uh, you know, you know, the Phil Spector fabled wall of sound. He wanted to get that early rock and roll feeling, I think, okay. from the production. I think it was an awful mistake to, you know, Phil Spector's an evil human being to begin <laughs> with, you know, um, murderer. You know, well, as it turns out, yeah. Um, so uh, you know, that's just bad vibes all told, right there. Um, so in any case, uh, it it felt like artistically not good for them. So they went ahead and said, "Well, let's make a real, a good Beatles album because this one was dismal," and they made uh, Abbey Road. But I probably I imagine during the making of Abbey Road, Phil Spector had come in and mixed and, and oh. produced "Let It Be." And so they released Abbey Road first and then let it be last. Now, the thing is, the Beatles could have gone out with a bang and not a whimper, but they went out with a whimper. Yeah. You know, uh, with the last Let It Be record. It was kind of like, okay, folks, well, we're done, but here you go. Here's a final record yeah, for you to chew on for a while. A little extra. You know, um, Let It Be has a lot of the uh, depressing aura that I found in the White Album. Uh, What's, what I find, I was thinking a lot about this last night, like, what, I had a buddy over last night who uh, can enjoy Beatles very much, and uh, we're, I was showing him the wonders of, of George Martin, we were talking about the wonders of George Martin, and just, you know, if you watch the Beatles anthology, their history, uh, George Martin is just such a sweet, sweet man, he always was so humble, and he would say, no, it was just the boys, it was the boys, wow. but I said, I said, okay, now let's listen to the string quartet arrangement of Eleanor Rigby, and you tell me if Paul McCartney came up with this stuff. No. No way did McCartney come up with that. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant string arrangement. Brilliant. Mm. Like, unbelievable. And following the lyrics, it responded to the lyrics, you know? He was expressing the mood of what McCartney sure. brought across. So, um, here's a three-chord song, you know? Eleanor Rigby is a three-chord song. It's real basic. You know, and at first I, I showed I showed my friend. I said, "Okay, this is this is Eleanor Rigby without all the string arrangements. It's not much, but actually it was. It was much. Yeah. It was a great song for all of its simplicity, but Martin gave it an extra dimensional quality. Yeah. You know, so uh, you know when we were in the midst of all this, I said, uh, I said, you know, uh, Paul." at this time was enamored of the Beach Boys. He was he idolized Brian Wilson at this point. And uh, we're supposed to believe that's by default, so did John. And nobody ever talks about it really, how John felt about the Beach Boys. There's not much word about it. He respected what they did. But when you look at the Beatles after they broke up and their final, their uh, per first solo records, in McCartney's case, his second solo record, and Lennon's Plastic Ono Band, you compare the two, it's, the differences are immense. Oh, really? Immense, immense, immense difference. Uh, McCartney was following through with the Let It Be vibe, highly produced, beautiful vocals. I showed him uh, a version of the song um, from the Ram album called Dear Boy. It is a 
amazing vocal arrangement. Well, I haven't I haven't listened to that in ages. Oh, it, his God. his first album on his own with the cherries. Yeah, the yeah. The bowl and whatever has always been a favorite of mine. Yeah, it's a good it's a good record. But it it, it was pretty stripped down for the yeah. most part. Yes. And mainly because I think he was he wanted to play everything, I guess. Yeah. But uh and then he went the whole hog, including the postage, when he got to Ram. That's when he went... Oh, is that right? Phew. I mean, you know, the single he released, Admiral Halsey, uh, uh, it's called uh, Uncle Albert. Uncle Albert. That little 45 is like a ab mini Abbey Road unto oh, itself. Oh, okay, there we know? go. So here we have all of this richness and, and texture and colors and, you know, psychedelic, you know, swashes of, of color and sound. And then we have Lennon, on the other hand, he has a piano, bass, and drums, and it is the most minimal. The drums literally in some songs just go boom. Oh, is that right? See, I've never been able to listen to the Plastic Ono band there. I just, I don't know. It the, just didn't catch me. Have you listened to the very, very first one? Uh, the one with Working Class Hero and... Uh, nah, way back, I, I think I tried to. It's, it's an immense work of art. I really respect yeah? that as a, as a true work of art. It's a work of brilliance, and he needed... You know, you get the sense that, like, the releases that the Beatles did post-Beatles, Harrison's uh, All Things Must Pass, a big, huge double album. Why? Yeah. Because all the re rejected material... That oh, he piled all that stuff in, huh? The yeah. stuff they'd never let him record? Right, like The Art of Dying, you know. Lennon and McCartney said, oh, that the theme is too depressing, The Art of Dying, that's too depressing, we can't have that. Oh, okay. So stuff like this got shelved. I'm sure Harrison was quite frustrated with all this. And uh, that, uh, The one that he got sued for, right? Um, uh, My Sweet Lord. My Sweet Lord. Yeah. 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 I think that's on that one, yeah. Um... So we have this disparity, really. Like, Lennon w wanted to get back to rock and roll, and McCartney wanted to get into the big, swashy productions. However, this goes to show you how dedicated McCartney was to the Beatles and how he tried his damnedest to keep that band together. Was uh, uh, Lennon, you know, was the guy that came up with the idea with, let's get rid of all the studio session layers of crap, and let's just be a rock and roll band and do something live. And McCartney went with it. He was okay with that. Huh. And you have to hand it to him. That's really something, considering his desire to uh, to make big productions and everything. He, you know, he said, okay, let's let's do that, as long as it keeps the Beatles together. You yeah, know? okay. So God bless him for that. He kept the Beatles going. Probably, we were talking about this too, probably if it wasn't for McCartney, the Beatles would have broken up by the time Peppers came out. Oh, okay. you know, he really tried so hard, you know. Um, but he was also a moron, you know, like he became like a despot when it came to his own songs. Harrison wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed to have his own ideas. Oh. You know, McCartney had to tell him what to play and how to play it down to details. Oh, okay. You know, like in the, it's a funny moment on the movie, Let It Be, where, uh... uh uh, Helter Skelter, oh. where this part, uh, Helter Skelter, uh, and then he goes, <laughs> right, and there's a moment in Let It Be where he's telling Harrison, when you bend, no, 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 you have to bend it really slowly when you come up, and you can see Harrison is just being, oh, I <laughs> Because actually, that little moment in the song isn't really much anyway. I make a big deal about it. <laughs> so, so we have, you know, on the one hand, this this lavish production uh, thing going on in McCartney's head, and and in Lennon said we well, have the stripped down, just be uh, raw and honest thing, rock and roll as it really is. You know. Was this also a time when Lennon was, you know, becoming more political? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, he started becoming political during the White Album. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, with her, right? She, when she entered his life, he started doing the the the, the bag series and the bed series and all yeah. this stuff, all these political statements. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I wonder if that went sort of hand in hand with this raw sound he wanted, uh, this rock and roll sound or whatever that he. Probably so. I mean, there was an, an immediacy to just plain old rock and roll. And you know, Joni Mitchell. You know, my buddy reminded me of this wonderful comment about, uh, Joni Mitchell made. Paraphrasing, uh, she said, "You know, I, I don't know what happened to, to rock and roll." She said, "When it became rock, what happened to the roll?" 
So oh. I like rock and roll, you know. Uh -huh. And you can look at it as like rock is kind of a masculine aspect and roll is kind of a feminine aspect, you know. Okay. But it's true, when rock and roll became rock, something, something changed, you know. And that we see all throughout the 70s, you know. So, um... So there we have it. So I'm going to go in the artistic order of things. They, they wrote, let it, wrote and produced and made Let It Be before Abbey Road. And another thing is I'm putting it off Abbey Road a little bit because it's going to be one hell of a job to come out. Oh, yeah, out. okay. okay. Uh, when we get to that uh, pastiche on the second side, that's going to be a wow. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So uh, the first song on, on the Let It Be record is, uh, you know, the song is called Two of Us, and I wonder... I wonder if Lennon actually, Lennon and McCartney actually wrote this together. Oh. Um, they, they, they split up by this point a whole bunch creatively, but there, there might have been a sentimental motion between the two of them to actually write together again. Hmm. Because it sounds to me like the verse is, is John and the chorus is Paul. Oh, okay. Um, because it's a very simple kind of folky song. So uh, we have that opening. It's um, part of the G shape here, or you can take the D shape, move it up here, it becomes a G. Right? But we're adding the sixth inside of that. Okay. I think the way they played it was... Something like that. This tune's been covered by a lot of people, hasn't it? Two of us? Yeah. I I don't know. I've I had I think I heard one one cover it, of it. You know. I think Rufus Wayne or Wainwright maybe has. It. I I swear I've heard a bunch of them. But go ahead. Wonderful song. The chords of G. Amy Man is done. Yeah, yeah, that's what I heard. Sounds a lot like John Lennon. Okay. Now this to me is holy McCartney here. Oh yeah. Pretty much the gist of the song. Maybe there's something down the line. There's no real surprises here. Okay. So far, is this like almost a three chord tune? No, uh, it has a, a minor third modulation. Oh, this is in the chorus? Uh, yeah, so. Uh, but it stands within the chord family template of G in the in the verses, and it's a uh, G. Da, 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 C, C over B, A minor, A minor seven. Again, very common movement. 
So, uh... Alright, so, uh, notice that what I find kind of interesting is kind of a, um, a, um, Precursory look at what happened. What happened in the 70s, where they replaced the 5/7 chord with the 11 chord, or here in this case, A minor. Uh, this is a D7 sus4. It, what it does is it eliminates the tritone. Okay. It softens the the the, the five chord, so it's like. Also carries that uh, the uh, G pedal to the coyote. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, right. So uh, is this like a two-minute wonder? Uh, this is, uh, I think, yeah, it's three and change. Oh, it is. Three eighteen. Uh, some, there's an interesting time change moment where you get a waltz. Right. Uh, for one, um, here, let me count it out so you can hear it. So this is all four, four, one, two, three, four. And I, this bass drum, I think it's supposed to symbolize the walking. Oh, okay. And back and, and then forward. we're back, right. So that's a nice little device, you know, a cute little um, Yeah. And it makes me wonder again if that, that, that is Lennon because he he did a lot of that kind of stuff, like just changing time signatures and oh, okay. things. All right, now, uh, oh yeah, uh, the opening lick. You'll find this in, in this song and the next one, uh, I Dig a Pony. Um, this whole idea of uh, breaking down the chord, the triad. You know, uh, my girl, that whole thing. So if I were to eliminate two notes of that, we get a G major triad. Okay. But they're passing tones, and actually, what it amounts to is a major pentatonic scale. Uh, so it's like um, it's like my girl. Okay. All right. They were doing on this record. They were doing a lot of that, like the kind of creating these licks. I think it was because of the purpose of, uh, you know, that they were like doing a live, they, they were planning on doing that rooftop concert, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, one thing I want to mention about Let It Be too. I, I watched the, like I said in the last video, I watched the movie, and what, one point I found particularly interesting is uh, when they were rehearsing in the studio and they were working things out, I saw the most energy and what they were doing, and when they were covering old rock and roll songs that they hadn't even written. Yeah. You know, they were just having fun rocking out. But when they were doing their own music, it seemed to lack that spirit. Oh, you know? a bit and, of drudgery? Yeah, that part, part of it, and I think they lost their chops as a live band, you know. They, they hadn't done, oh. you know, they were doing all the studio stuff now, yeah. like for years and years and years, and they were so great as a live band, you know, up until Revolver and stuff, you know, huh. they really, truly were. When you saw them live, they sounded like the record. I mean, their vocals were spotless. Oh.